with us today. We're in Luke chapter 18. We'll be looking at verses one through eight. And uh, just want to warn you, next week I'm going to skip ahead to verse 18 and then come back in the following weeks and do verses nine through 17 in other messages. Uh, so just letting you know that's what's going to happen next week. Today, Luke 18, verses one through eight. I just want to say before we read this text, before I preach this message, um, I think traditionally, at least for my own life and the way I've heard or viewed in my reading of the Bible, the application to this parable is pretty wide. And I can say after studying through Luke and studying this text specifically, Jesus' application is very narrow. And, and it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for you today because the church has kind of lost its ability to think this way and to, to pray this way. And everything that you've sung and heard today have been leading us up to the meaning Jesus has. So Luke 18, 1 through 8, invites you to stand as we acknowledge this is the word of God. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. There was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on earth? Father, help us now to understand the text. Help us to make application from your word into our actual lives, in the world that we live in as followers of Christ, that we might give ourselves to prayer and do that rightly. Lead us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen can be seated. So how do you process last weekend? By the way, I, I showed up here last Sunday. I had no idea what had transpired the day before. I often will go into a hole on Saturday to where I'm not allowing other things to affect me. So I didn't know told at church, I go home and then I get my TV on and then all these other things start to happen. So how do you process the level of evil and insanity, if you will, that would lead an 18 year old to target African Americans in a passive location like a grocery store, slaughtering 10 people and injuring ten other, three others. How, how do you process a man who cased people multiple times, who sat through their worship service, reading the paper, by the way, who placed ammunition throughout the building, who changed his shirt to security while they moved to a lunch, locked the doors, super glued the locks, and trapped them in a room. His plan was to kill them all. And I don't know if you've done your research. It was a Taiwanese church. He had lived in Taiwan, but he was a Chinese nationalist who hated the Taiwanese people. 
What do you do with that? How do you respond? How do you process it? How do you press on in the light of that kind of atrocity and evil? Now, let me take a sidebar just a second. I do pray to God that we never face a moment like that. That we live in an upside down world that the hatred of so many different groups of people grow. You need to know there are multiple levels of mitigation going on here. Some are very obvious to you. There are purposely stationed uniformed police officers throughout this campus when we gather, not just on Sunday. There are people in this room who are playing clothed at this moment who are prepared. So just a warning, those of you who have been asked not to carry your concealed carry, we don't need, and I'm not trying to be funny, the gunfight at the OK Corral if something ever happens. Our trained people would be devastated if they accidentally shot someone here. We are prepared as best as we can be. But we cannot be afraid. And and I want to add this. What saved lives last Sunday afternoon was the one man who lost his life, moved in bravery, diverted the man long enough that they took him down without the police even there yet. So brothers and sisters, we can't live in fear, but we live in the reality. Now, back to the sermon. What do you do? We live in a COVID world. Here's what we could all do. We just go back home and hide. Is that what Christians do? Is that what the Bible teaches? Is that how we respond? I don't have trite answers today. And if you take this sermon and if you take the words of Jesus as a trite answer, you don't understand what he's saying. Here's what we do. We look to God's words, God's word, and we give ourselves to biblical prayer. Not man prayer. We give ourselves to biblical prayer. And here's what prayer is. Prayer is the hopeful expression of faith in the Son of Man. Now, you've got to put this parable in its context. Jesus has just come out in Luke chapter 17, talking about the coming of Christ. It would be like the days of Noah and Lot, selfish living, people living for themselves, ignoring the things of God, standing on the precipice of judgment. And when Christ comes, he will bring vindication. So until then, what do his people do? They persevere in faith and in prayer. Now, we're not talking about the kind of prayer this morning that you're asking God for a new job or your house to sell or your kid to get accepted into college. This is a prayer for God to give justice to his weary and beaten down people. God's people live in a world where they are assailed, assaulted, and sometimes annihilated. So in the face of that, they must never give in. They must not lose heart. They must not throw in the towel. They must keep praying to God to put things right. The prayer Jesus is putting in front of us today requires the unrelenting tenacity to pray and to pray and to pray. Your kingdom come because this isn't your kingdom your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so two parts to this sermon first prayer is the continual expression of faith in the son of man especially in the face of difficulty and injustice He told them a parable to the effect they ought always to pray and to not lose heart. This verse forms the outline. First, we focus on this phrase. We ought always to pray. Now, there's an implied point here behind this. I think think here's what Jesus is saying. I know you struggle with prayer. 
If I take a survey today, how many of you in your Christian life have struggled with prayer? I'm going to get 100%. We've all struggled. Jesus knows that we're going to struggle with prayer. And we're going to struggle particularly when, when awful things happen. So we, we say, this ought to be our prayer the whole time I'm preaching. This is my prayer, my own heart, and for you. Lord, teach us to pray. We ought always to pray. It's necessary. That's what he's saying. We ought, it's necessary that we continually pray, that we're praying again and again, particularly in the face of hard things, difficulty things. This is a quote. I, Prayer is not a perfunctory and tidy exercise. Prayer is an existential battle, ongoing and ever present. So to Jesus, to drive this point home that we ought always to pray, he tells a parable. The parable is not simply about the fact that, that you should pray, but it directly relates to prayer for the Lord to come and to set things right. A prayer that is all the more urgent on the lips of those who are suffering some form of affliction. Disciples must pray with persistence while waiting for vindication. If not, then, then we'll fall away during this period of delay as injustice abounds around us. So Jesus gives us two characters in this parable, a judge and a widow. This is this it seemed very unusual at first. I mean, how does this thing work out? So you got a judge in a certain city who neither feared God nor respected man. He is electable in the United States. His religion has no effect on him. Not just his religion. He doesn't care about people. He doesn't keep the great commandment. He doesn't love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and his neighbor as himself. So what drives this man? Why is he a judge? Power. Power to make decisions over people's lives and to do it in such a way that pleases one person. Him. He's an unrighteous judge. Now, enter the widow. A widow in that city who kept coming and saying, give me justice against my <coughs> adversary. Don't assume immediately this is an older woman. She could have been young. There's no children, obviously, to help her. The reason she's coming to this judge and coming continually is because there's no one to speak for her. So she keeps coming. Whether this is 100% accurate or not, but just in my research, the way these kinds of settings would take place, um, there could be a lot of pandemonium and bribery was involved, but, but also just whoever was loudest. So this particular uh, commentator said, I imagine this woman screaming with an absolute shrill voice every day the judge showed up. Day after day after day, give me justice against my adversary. So don't get some neat courtroom in your mind where somebody steps to a podium and they got a little red light and a green light and you got 30 seconds. You got this woman who's continually screaming, crying out, give me justice against my adversary. Which means someone is causing this woman difficulty, likely this person is standing in, her, in the way of her needs being met. So she represents a vulnerable person who is in dire need, or if you will, she represents a believer in a hostile world. Verse four, while he refused, for a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, <laughs> this, this is fascinating, Though I neither fear God nor respect man. See, you are an evil human. Man, you're unaffected by people. Except, except, this woman's on my nerves. He says, basically, 
This widow keeps bothering me. I will give her justice so she will not beat me down by her continually coming. Literally, it says that she will stop beating me black and blue. I've had it. She's interrupting what he's trying to do. He's exhausted. His patience are worn out. So he says, I will give her justice. Verse six, the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. What does the unrighteous judge say? I will give her justice. So what is Jesus doing here? How, how does this whole thing work out? How is this unrighteous judge pointing us to something in prayer? It's a lesser to greater argument. If a dishonest judge responds to a persistent widow, how much more will God respond to his children? If a widow's nagging causes a response in the unrighteous, how much more will the disciples' request be honored by a righteous God? We pray to the holy righteous God who always does what is right. Always. He will give justice. And because he will give justice, we pray, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, we pray without ceasing. We continually pray. Now, let's think if then for a moment. If we continue to ask and seek justice, then God, who is just, will bring justice. This leads me to my second point, that prayer is the hopeful expression of faith in the righteous son of man who will give justice to his elect. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and, what does the end of the phrase say? Not lose heart. I say this with compassion and confession. Here's where you give up praying. You lose heart. When, when, when praying people see no sign of the answer they long for, it, it's easy for them to become discouraged. But Jesus says here, we must pray on. We must not lose heart. I, I just want you to think for a moment about your brothers and sisters in Christ in Ukraine. I got a video this, this week from Christy Sonia where they were in one of the cities handing out food and just the blank stares on people's faces. Standing in line, just getting something to eat. Just, you can just see the shock, the horror. This is not news, people. This is, you think, well, they ought to be excited they were getting food. They're just like zombies standing. Have you prayed for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Now, let me, let me put the shoe on another foot. This will be a little bit harder for you. A friend and a colleague, his name is Yefgeny. Yefgeny pastors Moscow Bible Church. I'm not exaggerating. Moscow Bible Church is Parkwood in Moscow. It's an expositional, Bible-believing, worshiping, missional community. If Guinea is so discouraged. He got out a few weeks ago and was with us at T4G. He's Russian. Brothers and sisters, this, this world is complicated. It's difficult and it is so easy to look at these myriads of complications and just give up. But look at what verse 7 says. Will not God give justice to his elect? I don't have time to explain fully who his elect are. Just simply say it this way. It's his people. Ephesians chapter 1 gives you the clearest explanation of who the elect are. It's his people. Those who are trusting in Christ alone for salvation. Will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? We're going back to this continual prayer. 
Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. There's so many verses that I could, so many places in the Bible I could have taken you. I just want to go to Revelation 6, verse 10. You can just write the reference down. This is the cry that is in heaven. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Those who have been persecuted and killed for their faith, Lord, how long before you judge and avenge our blood? That there is a delay, justice will come. He will give justice to them speedily. And let's put it in context with chapter 17. You say, I've been praying for justice and, and we've been praying for justice in the world. It looks like it's a long delay. So Jesus is partly answering why, why the delay. But then he says it's going to be speedily or suddenly without warning. What's going to be sudden without warning, brothers and sisters? The coming of Jesus. That's when justice fully comes. So we give ourselves to pray for justice. I'm going to read a quote here. The question about justice for those who suffer injustice and must cry out day and night limits the application of this par- what this parable says about prayer. It clearly does not mean that those who are persistent in prayer get whatever they ask for. Their cry for God is to set things right. Your kingdom come. God is like the judge in that he hears the pleas of his children and vindicates them, but he is unlike the judge in the parable. He is not reluctant to do what they need. If an immoral judge finally does the right thing, how much more will God, who is compassionate and merciful and holy, render justice to his children? I want you to turn with me to Psalm 55. You want to change how you pray, pray the Psalms. The Psalms will teach you to pray. This is very similar to the third Psalm. Psalm 55, verse 16. But I call to God and the Lord will save me. Evening, morning, and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan. He hears my voice. Verse 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will, what? Do do you see the implication here? In your praying, God is sustaining. He hasn't answered yet. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. It means to be knocked off your balance. But you, O Lord, will cast them down into the pit. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days. So it's acknowledgement of the evil around us. That God's going to bring it and make it right. So what do you do in the meantime? But I will trust you. So the message here of the parable, the message of the Bible is not that it pays to pester God who eventually will respond and do what you want. It's not the squeaky wheel gets to grease. The point is that God who demands justice is sympathetic to the plight of his people who will bring final vindication. So believers must boldly plead with God in prayer. Your kingdom come and know you're not dealing with an apathetic, wicked crook who mets out favorable decisions to the highest bidder. The difference is that Christians are not like the widow and God is not like the judge. Believers do not approach God as if they're poor bag ladies. They're identified as the elect and they have a relationship with God and will not God vindicate his elect. Now that leads to the so what? Jesus throws the so what question 
out there. I'm going to frame it first this way. Am I continually expressing faith in the righteous son of man through prayer? This is a great quote from Augustine. I'll try to break it down. Hang with me here. When faith fails, prayer dies. Got that? When faith fails, prayer dies. In order to pray, we must have faith. And that our faith fail not, we must pray. Faith pours forth prayer. And the pouring forth of the heart in prayer gives steadfastness to faith. So that's why I define prayer as the expression of faith. And you cannot separate these two. So Jesus asked the question, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He does not mean, is he gonna find Christians on the earth? That's not the question. You gotta put the question in the context. Will he find those believers who have faith to persevere in prayer, loyal to Christ? Will he find them? The faith that the Son of Man is looking for is not simply identification with his message. The Son of Man will be looking for those who are looking for him. He is calling for a faith that perseveres in allegiance to Jesus Christ. Now, as the world grows more hostile to Christians, what do Christians do? Well, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning. The world was absolutely hostile to Christians when the church began. Tried to stop and kill them at every point. What did the church do? They preached the gospel to this evil lost world. They were faithful witnesses to Christ. And eventually, eventually the world started going What? It wasn't until the church reached after worldly power, political power, and other things like that, that she began to falter. She's limped along in multiple ways as she continues to flirt with the world. Our flirtation with the world better end. We better realize who we are and why we're here. We better further realize why Jesus is delayed. Second Peter tells us, do not overlook this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he is patient towards you. So he's not brought justice yet. He hasn't come yet. Why? Why? Here's the answer. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The very evil he's going to punish God in his grace holds back the coming of his justice for lost to hear the gospel. And we as transformed people who have been saved by his grace, who deserve his judgment, look at this lost world that has gone nuts and have compassion and grace to move toward them with the gospel of Christ, that Jesus died in their place for their sin, buried and rose again on the third day to set them free from sin and death. We make this gospel known while we wait. And we wait prayerfully. Second Thessalonians chapter one. Second Thessalonians chapter one. How do you pray? What, what is, then what does it look like? All right, we, we ought to pray, but how, how is it that we go about it? Brothers and sisters, I, I, I am still learning to pray. I am woefully learning to pray. I don't know how to pray. Sorry, neither do you. But the Spirit of God makes intercession for us when we can't form the words. But here's what the church is overlooking. God has given you the Bible to show you how to pray. 
and we pass over it like this. All we gonna do is pray for, all we do is pray for sick people and some friends. Look at, look at this right here. Second Thessalonians one, five, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. Everybody look up here. <laughs> Here's how we know the kingdom is coming and that the kingdom has come. You know how you know the kingdom has come in your life? That you have so identified with Jesus in a lost world that you're suffering for your faith. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Okay. Can I read it one more time? The evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering since indeed God considered it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Look, <laughs> it's God's will that we suffer. This is part of the way the gospel gets known, but here's what God's telling you in the process. This will not go overlooked. It will not. You know why? Because he's God. He's God. God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Everybody look up here. Who's going to repay it? Are you to? Absolutely not. The Bible clearly tells you not to. That's not what the kingdom looks like. To grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among those who believe because our testimony to you was believed. To this end... We always pray for you. So here's how you pray for each other. Here's how you pray for yourself. That God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power. In other words, God make me to live out my faith in this world regardless of the consequences and the cost. Make me worthy of the calling. That you fulfill every resolve for every good work. Why? Why does God do this? So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you and him according to the grace of our God and of and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is ultimately through his people that God is glorified and God is glorified. You go back and study church history, study the movements of God, study these great outbreaks when the gospel spread rapidly, always preceding it was the suffering of his people. Now, brothers and sisters, you say, well, I'm, you know, I'm not coming back here. This dude's a prophet of doom. Look, I'm not trying to be smart aleck. I'm not trying to be hateful when I'm going to say, go find somebody to say what you want to hear. Do it. But look at the world around you. You can't pretend it didn't happen. Jesus, in his word, is preparing his people for hard times. And part of that preparation is teaching them to pray. So I go home last Sunday. After I have a bite to eat, I turn on the TV. And the first thing up there is the shooting in California. And it would go back and forth to explain what happened in Buffalo to California, Buffalo, California. So I'm sitting there on my couch or in my chair and this is what I'm praying. I'm moving back and forth like this in my prayer. God, wherever there is a man or a woman who is about to inflict this again on somebody else, thwart them, oh God. Stop it. Please. No more today. Watch over us as a people when we gather. One, then I'd move to this. Come, Lord Jesus. 
come. It burdens me that we live in such a racist, hateful world. There's, there's been more said about racism and, and calls for peace in the last 50 years than ever in the history of humanity. Human beings will never solve their own problems. I, I don't say that as a man who's given up. I'm not saying it to cover up sin. I'm just saying, brothers and sisters, human beings will never solve it. Here's what's going to solve it. Jesus Christ. And here's what people need to see. I'll just say it bluntly. Hatred will not be tolerated in this church. It won't be. That's not who God's people are. In whatever shape, fashion, and form you want to try to drag it in here among us, it won't be tolerated. We are to be the people of God. And we to look out at this broken world and say, come, Lord Jesus. Come set this right. That is the ultimate prayer of what we're asking for. Would you bow with me? I want to pray over you. Lord, my concern this morning as I look out over this congregation of people I know that there are people who have a very particular pain and hurting in their life. I know there are people struggling with sickness, death in their family, so many different things. I pray you meet those needs. But Lord, in the right way, I pray that we would rise above ourselves long enough to see there's much more to give ourselves to prayer for. So Lord, we ask for your justice. We ask that you bring it, that you bring it meted out in specific ways now. And ultimately we pray that you would come Lord Jesus. And until you come, would you fulfill in us the resolve for every good work, every work of faith by your power so that the name of Jesus would be glorified in us. We pray this in his name. Amen. Let's stand. Sing to the